You're watching. You're watching. You're watching. West Hartford Community, community television. television. Community television. For the community. For the community. By the community. And it's a wrap. Hello and welcome to Shalom Hartford. In the 80s, you might have been aware of an international, worldwide phenomenon. That was the Cabbage Patch Kid. The Cabbage Patch Kid was produced by a company in Hartford. The name? Coleco. What you might not have known is that Coleco was originally the Connecticut Leather Company. Today we're going to be speaking to one of the visionaries and one of the leaders of Coleco. I'm Pat Kazakoff. You're watching Shalom Hartford. Stay with me and we're going to meet Arnold Greenberg. How did the Cabbage Patch doll come to you? It came to me uh, and uh, to us at the uh, company by a, uh, a backwoods uh, Georgia artisan, actually from Cleveland, Georgia. His name is Xavier Roberts and uh, he developed a concept of a much larger, much more expensive doll. He realized that there would be an opportunity to mass market a different, smaller, less expensive version of that doll. Was he and, a well-known artist? Uh, no, no, I think he was uh, known regionally at the time and that's all. And why did he come to you? Well, he came uh, to us because uh, the larger doll companies in the field at that time, in particular Hasbro and Mattel, passed on the concept. They didn't want to license it. They thought that uh, the concept really had no uh, marketing appeal. So he came to us, a company that had never made a doll, but was very eager to make a doll, which is the iconic toy uh, for a toy company. And why, why, if Hasbro gave up on it and Mattel gave up on it, what did you see in that doll? We saw an opportunity to add the appropriate bells and whistles to the doll, uh, to significantly reduce the price that a person would have to pay and at that time it was no more expensive than $29.95 and in certain cases versions of it were just uh, $20. What we did is uh, add the concept of giving a name to each doll, Susie May or uh, Tommy uh, Ellen uh, Elifer. Uh, how did you, you choose the names? Well, we used the 1938 State of Georgia name registry, believe it or not. And then we said, look, why doesn't each doll uh, have a different dress? And what we did is uh, create a matrix whereby no two dolls looked alike. No two dolls, of course, had the same name. And what we did is add the feature of adoption. What you did is adopt the doll. You adopted the kid. You didn't buy it. That would be much too commercial. And as a result, we created a relationship between the child, the child's parents, and the company. And that, of course, gave us an opportunity to sell follow-on products as well. So how does that work? Like if you have, you, you were, Coleco by that time was a nice size company. Yes. Okay. So how does that work? Who makes those kinds of decisions? Well, uh, a decision like that uh, really involved just about everybody at upper levels of the company, not just uh, my brother and me, but certainly sales and marketing as well in determining whether or not the time was right to enter the field and what changes had to be made to uh, adopt it or adapt it for success. I love the concept of adoption. Yes. Like I've never, who, is there one person that you could credit with coming up with that idea? Uh, no, I think more than one uh, were involved and uh, uh, I, I, won't, I won't single out any, any people for credit other than a team of veteran Coleco players. Did you know it was going to be as successful as it was? Uh, no. 
You had no idea. Well, we, we had hopes, but we uh, certainly weren't convinced that that uh, would happen. It was a new field for us. We knew that uh, other companies had passed on it. So we tried an experiment. We convinced Macy's in New York to put a dozen on the counter without any advertising. Uh, this was in November of 1983. And they sold like the proverbial hotcakes. They just went off the counter. From and after that date, we, we couldn't make them fast enough. So how many Cabbage Patch dolls in the end did you sell? Do you have a figure on that? Oh, no, millions. Millions were sold in the space of a few years. What's millions? Well, millions, uh, I would say easily, uh, uh, easily five million or so were sold in the space of just a few years. Uh, and, and that was certainly more of a single item than we had ever sold in our history. Before you had the Cabbage Patch dolls, you were in ColecoVision? Yes, You were yes. in Telstar? Yes, we were very much in our electronic phase at that time, starting with Telstar. And what we were eager to do is uh, remain a, a toy company at, at heart. And therefore, we said, look, it's worth taking a chance on a doll product, even though it is so unusual. And the cost of entering was very inexpensive. The other items we made, like ColecoVision or Atom or Telstar, usually involved expensive tooling, which took several uh, months to produce. And dolls are essentially soft material, st sewn and stuffed. So it was very easy to get started and then to multiply the, uh, the units. As you were selling the Cabbage Patch Kid, you were also still selling ColecoVision oh, and yes. Telstar? Yes. So at the beginning of, uh, of, of the show, I mentioned that you went from Connecticut Leather Company to Coleco. Uh, How did that happen? Well, it, uh, it happened in stages, largely to my older brother Leonard, who has since uh, passed away. He entered uh, the business in the late uh, 40s, shortly after graduating from uh, Trinity College. That's when our business was in the hobby craft stage. We took the leather from Connecticut Leather and used that as the basis for a development, a line of uh, hobby craft kits. Well, originally your father was selling findings for, right. for shoes. That is correct. And so uh, from that you went into the hobby business with right. Leonard um, as sort of taking uh, the lead on that. That is right, that is right. And then we, we had a hobby craft uh, phase that really uh, lasted it until we went public in 1962, and that really was heralded by the development of a rigid plastic wading pool. We were the first to produce. Uh, that's a pool that really entered into the next phase, namely recreational products for the company. And the third phase, of course, was characterized by electronic products. So why did you go, why did you go I can see how you went from the shoe findings to the hobby craft, mm -hmm. selling the hobbies to uh, veteran homes and hospitals, but how did you go from that to the swimming pool? It, it seemed clear to us that there were limitations in the appeal of the hobby craft products, and we dreamed of being a larger company with other products, and uh, we had factory space available to us at the time, and uh, engineering talent that pushed us into, into that field. And from there, there was a natural expansion from wading pools into steel wall above ground pools that started when we added the Kestrel Company in Springfield. You line. talked about the dream. You talked mm -hmm. about that you dreamed of a bigger company. Sure, sure. Did you and your brother dream of this, or did your father dream of this? Like, where did the dream come from? At, at this point in time, uh, the dream was focused uh, by Leonard, who realized that there was a limitation, certainly, in the shoe findings business 
That was not his Leonard, that was not Leonard's dream. He certainly was much more interested in the development of a product that could be manufactured uh, and sold in larger quantities. Was Leonard an engineer by training? Oh yes, yes. Leonard, uh, Leonard uh, loved nothing better than a factory and was very, very important to the factory intensive product lines that we developed over the years. So then how do uh, you come into this? Well, uh, I, uh, I come in as a little brother who uh, went on to law school and uh, was able to take the company public at a very early stage when indeed we were doing no more than $2 million worth of business and uh, hopefully bringing with it a, uh, a feeling for the market and for opportunities, finance, communication. So the little brother, yes. i.e. you, yes. was a lawyer? Uh, yes, I, as a matter of fact, I practiced law uh, briefly uh, with a local firm and uh, my largest client was Coleco. And uh, the demands of a growing company were such in the 60s that I really had to give up practice or, and join the company full time, first as counsel, but very quickly uh, being involved in all other aspects. So you were the lawyer who took the, the company public? Uh, y yes, yes, uh, with the aid of a, a local firm, Cooley and Company, uh, uh, a very great uh, partner in the process. Now what about, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in the dream because you said like Leonard liked no, he, he liked to be in the factory, he liked factory work, but you didn't have that, that wasn't who you were. That was not, uh, that was not my uh, major interest, right? right. Factories and, were, were not. Right, and so you were more in the marketing? Marketing, I oh yes, yeah, marketing, uh, selling communications, product development, scouting out what might be happening in, uh, in terms of developing technologies. And that is what took us into electronics in the mid-70s. So you, uh, the incentive to start the handheld electronics, uh, the ColecoVision Telstar, mm -hmm. that came from you, would you say? Well, I, I, we all like, most major product changes, uh, there's no one person involved. There's a team of upper management, sales, marketing, and uh, we had contact with an inventor who had a product that uh, was very much like one that was being introduced at, in the marketplace at that time, the so-called Pong game, which we call Telstar. We said, that is something we should get into and develop our skills in electronic technology. Following Telstar came along the one-player football game and uh, other two-player sports games. So when you look back, you look back at all these products, because there's a lot of them, do you have a, a, a product that you fell in love with? Was there something that you loved? Well, there, I suppose there, uh, there are at least uh, two or three I have to mention. The development of the waiting pool was very important to close out the hobbycraft era of Coleco and introduce us into the recreational product era. Overlapping that, of course, came Telstar, one-player football games and ColecoVision, which really heralded the, the, the electronic uh, era. Uh, in between was the recreational products that of course overlapped with electronics. That's when we went into the above ground swimming pool and recreational products. Is there, is there one product that you fell in love with? Ultimately, uh, that has to be the Cabbage Patch Kids. I, I have to confess uh, having a, a favorite child, and that's because it gave the company worldwide recognition and brought, more importantly, worldwide joy to so many children and their parents in various languages. What was the largest um, amount of sales that you did 
uh, in all those years you were in business? Did you have one year that, as the kids say, rocked? Well, that was uh, several years in the mid-80s uh, when uh, our sales became uh, very close uh, to uh, three quarters of a billion dollars. Billion. That's a lot of money. Yeah, it's a lot of a lot of sales. A lot, lot of, of money. sales. Right, a lot of, right, lot of work. Right. A lot of sales. A lot of work. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So we go from incredible success uh, in the mid '80s mm -hmm. um, to to the Atom Computer, which also was a product of the early to mid '80s. Atom was introduced in '83. Uh, it's very interesting. It, the same year that Cabbage Patch was introduced. Same year, exactly. Same year, yes. So what happened? What happened with the Atom computer? The Atom computer was an early stage home computer. Pioneers in the computing field very often wind up with arrows in the back, we find. We had competitors such as Mattel, Commodore, Atari, IBM Junior, all of which uh, hadn't adequately solved the challenge of why do we need a home computer? Is it something more than a uh, video game machine? And e even more uh, disturbing was the reality that debugging the software needed to find some practical use proved to be a challenge that none of us in the business uh, approved to be up to. We realized that perhaps that piece of technology was a bridge too far for us and we retreated from uh, the home computer. When you field. look back and you, you, know, you, you look at the chart and the chart goes up, up, mm -hmm. up, and then 1985 it starts to go mm -hmm. down till 1988. What would you say looking back, and now you have the benefit of mm -hmm. looking back, what was the one thing that started to, 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 turn, to turn the tide? The, the most significant thing, I think, was the fact that the Adam experience, which was not f successful financially, weakened our fa finances. And like most uh, family businesses that grow, uh, particularly in our industry, they tend to be uh, undercapitalized. We relied heavily on going to the public marketplace when we needed more funds. and to a banking and relied also on a banking consortium. We had planned a, a public offering in 1987 and we're victims of a major crash in the market. A, the percentage of uh, crash was even greater than what we've experienced in uh, this century. In and the 2008? The yes, oh yes. And uh, that uh, really, disturbed our banking group as well. So the problem was simply that we could not find, continue to finance the company at the level that we had become. Now you have the benefit of looking back. Could you, what would you have done differently now? It's 20 years later approximately. Mm -hmm. I think uh, we, uh, we perhaps let ourselves be, in part, a prisoner of our own creativity uh, and uh, let ourselves expand without sufficient strength under us, without sufficient means, capital means, to finance further growth, particularly if certain products would become obsolete or no longer popular. Uh, popular. We relied on the fact that the market, the public marketplace for selling stock had always been there and that the banking group was always there to finance expansion. So In what would you have done differently? Well, we would have trimmed our growth. We would have said this is a wonderful product, but we can't afford the risks in introducing it this year. We have to do it in another year when our financial base is stronger. I suppose to be more poetic about it, one might say our reach exceeded our grasp. 
and uh, that's what... Could there have been a bit of hubris involved also? No, I don't think it was hubris. Uh, we were counting on the successful experience we had known for almost uh, 20 years in the marketplace. We were able to make acquisitions and uh, count on uh, the public and private marketplaces for debt or stock purchase to finance what we were doing. Uh, but uh, that came uh, to an end quite, uh, quite suddenly, quite suddenly. This is Shalom Hartford, and so we're a little Jew-centric here. Mm -hmm. Did being Jewish have any influence on how you conducted yourself, what your ideas were? Do you, do you see anything that came from your Jewish background? Oh, yes, 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 very much so. The Jewish background certainly has, uh, first of all, lived by my father. My father was a, an immigrant, came here when he was 11, and he was a great believer in the American dream, in the promise of America, that if you worked hard, worked hard, gave it your all, you could succeed that if you were ambitious and took advantage of educational opportunities, you could rise without, uh, without limit. And I think to a great extent, my older brother and I benefited from that instruction because we, like he, worked hard, uh, took advantage of educational opportunities, and it enabled us to succeed and become believers in the promise of America. We saw it being realized in our own family. We're, we're talking about you and a certain generation, but now it's 2018. Yes. Do you see a difference in how kids are today? Well, yes, uh, of course. They, uh, uh, they take for granted things that we had to work for when we were younger. My brother and I were growing up in the 1930s and 40s, a terrible time, a terrible time economically, a, a worldwide depression, a terrible time for Jewish people. And uh, the worst of those times are not over. There is ample uh, anti-Semitism still in the world, but uh, Jews have been able to come out of the closet in the United States. They can work for banks and insurance companies. They can become leaders of cultural institutions. My brother Leonard was one of the founders of Hillel at uh, Trinity. And uh, I have taken some leadership positions in the overall community, in particular the arts and education community. That's uh, something of great, uh, of great interest uh, to me. Uh, and the Jewishness, I think, has influenced very much uh, the, uh, the interest I've developed uh, in organizations. Uh, I, uh, I'm struck by uh, the fact uh, that as Jews we believe uh, that uh, we must do justice, uh, love mercy, and walk humbly before God. We must help the stranger, we must help the impoverished, we must help God is perfect this the world. A new, is this a new philosophy now that you've reached a certain age? Um, or is this something that you carried with you from when you were young? Or did you just become aware oh, of oh, this? Oh, no, no. It started certainly when I was younger and uh, has intensified as I got older and studied more and had a better understanding of what's happened historically in the world. Do you love being Jewish? Oh, I, I certainly do. You do? I certainly do. I think it very much informs what I do, my attitude, and how I react to things, both challenges, disappointments, and, uh, and honors. You are a first generation born yes, in Hartford. Yes. And what influenced, what do you think influenced you more, being Jewish or being first generation? 
That, uh, I think, is impossible to uh, separate. Uh, so many Jews of that era were first generation, not just in Hartford, but elsewhere. So they were imbued with some of the same DNA that comes from being very close to the boat that uh, brought uh, a parent or two over. We've been talking to Arnold Greenberg. Uh, he was the past president of Calico. Uh, you, heard, you heard he developed, Calico developed the Cabbage Patch doll, Calico Vision, Telstar, the above ground swimming pool, uh, the Atom computer. It's a long, long story. And um, I think it would be a great movie. Mm. What do you think? It is a very common Jewish story. Uh, immigrant parents uh, who imbued children with the realization that the social mobility goes upward as you educate yourself and, and work hard and wonderful things can happen. I, uh, I'm delighted to say that there is nothing unique or unusual about our story. I might beg to differ. <laughs> Arnold, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Der Rebbe hat gehissen, frei lachsam, frei lachsam, frei lachsam, frei lachsam, frei lachsam.